actually hurt. No, I think she is. Yeah, she's Ouch. hurt. She took a hard fall off there. Oh, okay. hey, gosh, I hope she's okay. All right, welcome in. It is a uh, new edition of the Daily Puck Drop live from Idaho. How about that? The first time we've taken the Daily Puck Drop on the road. You can see the backdrop. I, I think you can see. Can you see the lake from there? No, I don't think you can see the lake from there. Although, I think off to my left shoulder. Yeah, that's a that's a moose. Uh, we're here in Blanchard, Idaho. Uh, because my wife's maiden name is Mo. We like to say Idamo. I know it's a stupid joke. It really is, but it's funny. All right. It, it makes us laugh. All right. So the daily puck drop uh, live here from Idaho or Idaho uh, is we'll uh, do the same content we always do. All right. We're going to give you about 25 minutes of a uh, hard hitting sports analysis or, or not. And of course uh, we'll set you up what's coming up uh, later in the show. It, it's a Friday. So Ryan Divish of the Seattle times, he is back for his uh, weekly visit bi-weekly visit. And then of course, uh, Chris Egan, from King 5 News, we'll stop on by, brought to you by Fat Zach's Pizza. All right, what do we got on the Daily Puck Drop today? All right, we got Masters first round, second round is underway right now. Yes, I'll be sitting my uh, my hefty, large ass on a couch pretty much all day today and tomorrow and Sunday watching the first round of the Masters. You would say, why, why did you drive all, all the way over to Idaho to do this? I, I You know what? I don't know just because a different scenery, change of scenery. Uh, we are in Idaho. This is my wife's family's cabin, they like to call it, lake house, what have you. Beautiful. It's warm, 66 degrees. It's going to be gorgeous today. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Idaho, they, they do it right, I'm going to tell you that. All right, we got Masters first round thoughts. Mariners start a series with the Cubs. We're going to get into the Otani interpreter. <laughs> I think I can honestly spend the entire time on this guy. I mean, some are going to be critical of him and some are going to really come down on the guy. You know what I call the guy? A hero. Because that's how you bet. That's some damn wagering what this guy has put together. But let's get first uh, to the Masters first round thoughts. They're in the second round right now. Of course, it got delayed yesterday, two and a half hours because of the weather. So they weren't able to finish up uh, all of the first round. Guys like Tiger, Max Homa, Jason Day, all had to come back this morning and finish it and then start up right again and play. Uh, I think there are about 23 holes that they'll have to play today. Tiger, they said, slept like three hours. I mean, he's a machine anyways. Speaking of machines, uh, Scotty Scheffler, just an absolute cyborg. He is just ridiculous. You know, Rory's playing next to him, and Rory said, y you watch him play and you go, I and I don't even know if he's playing all that well. He's like, is he doing anything like like spectacular? But then you'll look down and you go, well, he doesn't have a bogey and he's six under. I mean, he's just, there is no better player in the world right now. Clearly, because he's ranked number one, thanks tips, at ball striking. No one's a better iron player than this guy. And the thing I love about Scotty Scheffler is this. In a sport where everyone is tries to be the cookie cutter swing and everything's got to look the same and they got track man and video and analytics and all this. And it's not to say that Scotty Scheffler doesn't use all that stuff, but he kind of just plays uh, feel. It's not the same swing as everybody else. His feet move all over the place. You wouldn't necessarily teach kind of the way he swings the club. You necessarily wouldn't teach that, but he gets the job done. I mean, no one. What is better with his iron play? How about that shot on 12? I mean, did he get a little lucky yesterday? Yeah, but he's he's also a great player. Hits it in the bunker at 12 and then and then flops it in. Uh, he doesn't go into the water. I mean, there's, there's just a lot. Of, he got a lot of lucky. I think that was on 13 where he almost went in the water. I mean, he got lucky on some stuff, but he makes his own luck. And he's one shot back right now, Bryson DeChambeau. And if you're in a gambling league, in a in a, in a, uh, a golf league, you're all just kicking yourself that why you didn't take Scotty Scheffler. Like me, I took Brooks Kepka. I took one of the live guys just because in our golf league, you never get to use a live guy, so I thought I'd use him here. But now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay for it. Because Scotty Scheffler is going to win the damn thing. He's going to win his second green jacket. And it should have been obvious to everyone that he was going to win it again. I don't see him faltering, and I don't really see anyone taking him out. He is the... Tiger Woods right now of his generation. I know that's that's being crazy to say that, but the way he's playing right now, I just think guys get intimidated by him. I think Rory got a little intimidated by him yesterday where he almost just kind of admitted that, God, when, when he plays like this and he putts, and I, I don't know how you beat him. 
He's, he's right. I, I don't know how people beat him. Uh, Rory was better, but maybe too far behind right now. But again, one thing that's always hurt Rory McIlroy was getting off to these bad starts. And uh, clearly did not get off to a bad start. Could have played much better. But again, right now, one under, that's good for him, at least as one under through the first round. Uh, th certainly the biggest story of the day in the first round, uh, besides Tiger being Tiger for the most part, didn't finish strong uh, there to finish his round this morning, bogey 18. Taking a sip of coffee for those just listening. Uh, Jason Day's pants. I mean, I didn't know we were bringing parachute pants back. I didn't know Hammer was coming back. Whatever he's trying to pull off and what he thinks is good, it's not working. Those aren't good. Did you see him on the green when the wind was blowing? <laughs> it looked like a freaking parachute out there. I don't know what he's trying to pull off with the huge parachute pants and the big pleated pants that used to be popular like in the 90s, but uh, whoever is dressing him, yeah, I don't know. I, I would pivot uh, to something else. Uh, Bryson DeChambeau, of course, your leader after the first round, seven under. Cool thing about Bryson, we don't know where his game is at because we haven't seen the guy play at all. Because he's playing on live, and you know, unless you have the, unless you're watching the CW network, you have no idea. I thought in the interview yesterday with Scott Van Pelt, he he seemed humbled and that he had learned from his past mistake when he misspoke, you know, that years ago about the Masters, about Augusta, how it's gettable, and boy, if you you just you knock it around here and there, you'll shoot a great score, and then was just brought down to his knees. I thought he responded better yesterday. He said all the right things after the round about how. Listen, you've got to respect the course. You've got to respect the holes. You've got to respect the conditions here. And he went out there and with his length and his putting ability, which he is just one of the great putters on, in the world, one of the top five great putters in the world, uh, you can see what he can do to that course. So if someone's going to challenge Scotty Scheffler, uh, certainly Bryson DeChambeau after the first round, he's, he's got the entire arsenal to do it. I thought Max Homa was great. He finished strong, minus the bogey on 18, playing with Tiger. He had talked about before being intimidated by playing with Tiger, but, boy, just he kind of learned, it felt like yesterday, that uh, he kind of got past being perhaps intimidated by Tiger Woods and played and played great golf yesterday. Jordan Spieth did not play great golf. He shot a first-round 79. He's going to most likely miss the cut. Justin Ray, who does a terrific job, uh, covering golf on on social media on X had this great stat. He has a bunch of great stats. You want to follow a guy? Just search Justin Ray. Just a wealth of knowledge. Past ten, uh, last ten champions have a first round scoring average of sixty eight point one. Okay, so just look at that. Whoever shot that, that's likely going to be your champion. Also, this each of the last eighteen winners uh, were tied for eleventh or better there after the first round. So just go look at the leaderboard, look who was tied for 11th or better, and one of your winners is going to come out of there. You, this is a course where you, you're not coming back from a huge deficit to win this thing. Guys just aren't going to come back to you, and certainly you're not going to have enough arsenal to sit there and catch those guys. But round two underway Friday. Uh, we'll have, of course, a, a full recap of the entire tournament coming up on Monday. Andres Gonzalez from Sirius XM PGA Tour Live is going to join us on the daily, on the daily puck drop on Monday. Uh, he's going to uh, stop on by for about 15 minutes to recap all the action. So we'll do that with Dre coming up there on Monday. All right, let's get into the juicy one. Otani's interpreter. <laughs> this thing, man. Wow. Now, I know everything and all the info that has come out, and most people are going to say has exonerated Otani. A and I guess maybe it has, but I, I still just cannot get past this guy just never checked his bank account? I mean, how many of you people just out there right now don't check your bank account? I, I mean, I'm, I don't know. Do, do you check it every day, every couple days, every week, every month? You're telling me Otani just never checked his bank account? And this guy allegedly took stole $16 million out of his banking account uh, to pay off these gambling losses? Uh, allegedly didn't bet on baseball, bet on like college soccer though. I mean, that's, you know, you've reached real rock bottom as a gambler. And I think we've all been there. Okay. When you are betting on women's college soccer, that's rock bottom. Okay. Uh, allegedly it says Otani not involved. He lost more than $180 million uh, in gambling on sports. 
forty million dollars in debt to that bookie uh, at down there in Los Angeles. Uh, the news and notes that have come out of this, I mean, it is a lengthy read. Uh, his uh, Otani's team, remember, originally told reporters that Otani had transferred millions to the bookmaker to cover the losses, but then changed the story and blamed the interpreter, Mizahura. He said, that, see, that's the part of the story that I don't get, is because they came out, their story flip-flopped on ESPN. That's why I think most likely, I mean, with all the, the reports that come out in the federal investigation, that it does appear that this guy acted alone. But just something still doesn't feel right about that ESPN interview. Because Otani's camp that came out and said that he had that he had been a part of it and Mizahur had been a part of transferring the money. But then they reversed course on that story 24 hours later. There still is an element of this story that's missing. I don't know if it just means Otani was involved in all the betting, but I, I also don't think Otani's completely 100% clean. That's just me. Maybe that's something I want to believe. I don't know. I love conspiracy theories, but it just seems odd. More of the federal investigation revealed that apparently Mizahura impersonated Otani on the phone to gain access to his player's account. How the hell does that happen with a bank account? How can you do that? How can you just impersonate a guy? And then all of a sudden the bank account just like, okay, here's all the money. Because apparently in 18, when he joined the Angels, Mizahura helped him open up a bank account in Arizona. And he was the trans he was translating for him to set up the bank account. And his entire angel salary was deposited in there. But Otani allegedly never gave him control of it. And then Mizahura, the translator, refused to give access to others for that bank account in Otani's camp. His agent, his uh, accountant, which again is odd. Like if you were the agent and the accountant and all these other financial advisors with Otani and the interpreter doesn't uh, refuses to give you access to it don't you start questioning that and go like well why why are you not allowing us to have access to that private account because allegedly Otani wanted it to be private that's the other part of the story that it just doesn't pass the sniff test to me Feels like something is awry with that. Why did they want that one account to be private? Was it so they could place bets on 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 games? But then Otani was like, "Hey, li- you need to be the one that's placing all these bets. I can't ever be associated with it." That just seems odd. That that's a failure of like leadership with the Otani camp and like the checks and balances, and it really for Otani himself. I mean, you are worth millions. Okay, you just signed a $700 million contract. At some point, don't you have to be kind of watching, like your account, things that are going on, who has access to it. I know you trust this guy and all that, but man, for a guy, (laughs) I mean, I think most of us notice there's a couple hundred dollars missing from our bank account. This guy is missing $16 million, and there's no red flags that go off for Otani his agent, his financial advisor, any, anybody associated with his camp. Yeah, it is, yeah, I know everyone wants to come out in the baseball world and just say that, say, this clears Otani. I, I'm just still not convinced that there wasn't some type of knowledge at all. Uh, Mizahura, you want to talk about a degenerate gambler, this guy, uh, allegedly or reportedly uh, placed over 19,000 bets Jesus Christ. This tops the go-to guy. 19,000 bets between the late of, of 2021 to January of this year. And per bet, he averaged $12,000 per bet. Again, he won more than $140 million, but lost $180. That's why he owed $40 million uh, to this uh, bookie. He faces 30 years in federal prison. Likely, it seems like he's going to give himself up, I think, sometime uh today but what a story man i mean there's just a lot to unpack there one the lengths that this guy went to to get money from otani the amount of bets and the figures that he was putting down what he bet on i mean women's college soccer i mean i shoot i mean i've bet on spring training before the wnba i thought that was rock bottom but college soccer that's that takes it to a whole new level they did, the federal prosecutors or federal investigators did 
uh, have the phones of both. And there was one uh, a federal agent who spoke Japanese and they went into their phones and they looked at all the text messages between them and did, did said that there was no conversation between the two uh, about sports bets. That doesn't mean that they didn't talk about it because certainly they could have just talked to, uh, about bets in person. But for a guy that was just considered like a brother, a close friend who was with him all the time, for Otani not to know any of this, I don't know. That that seems hard for me to swallow. It really, really does. I don't know. I mean, if, if he really, truly didn't know a single thing about it, then this Mizuhura guy is a hell of a like special ops agent guy to keep all that stuff, especially with the amount that he was betting and betting all the time. And for him and for for Otani not to get a sniff of it at all, pretty incredible. Uh, it'd be a fascinating story to keep uh, following. You know Rob Man for the Major League Baseball wants this thing to go away. A sap. All right, the Mariners are back at it today. They had Thursdays off after flying back from Toronto. Tough road trip. Obviously, they get back home and start a three-game series uh, with the Cubs. Bryce Miller, Jordan Wicks uh, get the uh, ball here coming up uh, tonight from Team Mobile. Wicks has started uh, two games this year. He's pitched over about uh, – never hasn't pitched over four and two-third innings uh, so far this year. He's allowed four earned runs. Miller coming off his best start. And it's only been two, right? Uh, against the Brewers, where he allowed uh, zero uh, earned runs. Uh, he gave up three hits there in seven innings of work. Ryan Davish is coming up a little bit later here at PuckSports.com. Of course, you can watch it on YouTube. Please leave a comment. Also, Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, wherever you find your podcast. Davish joins us every Wednesday and Friday. Brought to you by Chalet Bowl, ChaletBowl.com. Uh, He's got a terrific article that's up at SeattleTimes.com uh, right now. And so much of in it i think you have to agree with and then he goes a deep dive into the numbers offensively where they're at through 13 games remember this was an offense that they were hoping would be improved uh, this offseason they did everything they possibly could to cut down on the strikeouts increase their offense knowing they were going to give up a little bit on defense but their offense just has not been any better whatsoever and Divish is uh, writes in there, and, I, and he's correct, and we talked about it, I think, on Wednesday. They are lucky to be 5-8. and eight. I mean, they really are. Uh, very well could be 3-10 and 10 on the season with the way they're playing. Easily. And they haven't played good baseball at all. And so they're extremely lucky right now to be three games under 500 now no one in the division is pulling away Astros are having their own issues Rangers aren't you know aren't lights you know lights out right now so again they haven't buried themselves and it's only 13 games into the season they're not they're not the Marlins and, and other teams like that have buried themselves but the offense just I mean the early returns are terrible I mean they're hitting 207 278 on base uh, 324 slugging, 138 strikeouts. 138 strikeouts and 37 walks. Uh, Divish doing just a deep dive into the numbers. Two strike hitting, which they wanted to be better at. That was kind of their their mantra this year, their approach. One thir Here's their slash line with two strikes that Divish uh, pulled up and put in the newspaper today at seattletimes.com. 132, 212, 173. They lead Major League Baseball in K percentage, 29.2%. Again, they were bottom of the list last year in this category. And this is the one that is just remarkable that Divish came up with. You remember DePoto had these comments, I think, after the first homestand about how, well, I mean, this group of teams, it was the Red Sox and, and the Guardians, they threw us a lot of breaking pitches, but, you know, nobody else will, really. You know, just it was it was an isolated series. We'll be fine. Of the one thousand one hundred and eighty three pitches they have seen so far this season, who the hell Divis found this stuff? I mean, it's probably easily found, but my God, they have seen fifty nine percent of those one thousand one hundred eighty three pitches have been off speed. That's third most in Major League Baseball. And of those 1,183 pitches, which, again, as Divish wrote in the Seattle Times uh, today, seattletimes.com, 
59% have been off speed. They are hitting 198 versus those pitches. They're only hitting 220. Now you're going to say, well, okay, they can't hit off speed. Most, most, most teams aren't good at hitting off speed pitches, and most teams aren't good with a two strike approach. So they must be great hitting fastballs because that's what DePoto said. That way, when we get a more fastball counts, we'll turn it loose. They're hitting 220 against fastballs and slugging 339 this season. Fourth worst in baseball. This isn't just a breaking ball problem for this offense. This is an everything problem. They can't hit fastballs. They can't hit breaking balls. They can't hit anything with two strikes. They're striking out a ton. In fact, this offense that they reconstructed this offseason, right, is worse than it was last year up until this point. There's no debate about that. Absolutely zero debate. So they'll get back at it today, three-game series with the Cubs, and then the Reds come into uh, town. Great conversation yesterday with both Mike Garofolo, if you missed it, NFL.com, NFL Network. Go check it out. It's brought to you by Hartley and Hartley Insurance and also Zogs on Fox Island. We talked a lot about the draft, Michael Penix, the quarterbacks. What are they, you know, what are the Patriots going to do? They're at three. What's Washington going to do at two? Where's Michael Penix going to kind of fall in that draft? Go check it out uh, there at pucksports.com. Also, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you find your podcast. Go check it out. Great conversation yesterday with Garofolo. Also, with Rob Staten from SeahawksDraftBlog.com, which is brought to you by Superior Linen Service. And and Rob does just an incredible job of breaking down the draft. He's got an unreal mock draft, a four-round mock draft with the Seahawks. We talked about the offensive line, Fautano of Washington, the Oregon State uh, offensive lineman. Great conversation with that. Two guys that play on the outside. Can you move them on the inside to play offensive line? Up at SeahawksDraftBlog.com right now. There's a piece written up there by Curtis Allen, not the, and I know Curtis is listening and watching, not the Curtis Allen that played basketball at UW, a different Curtis Allen, about the pros and cons of drafting a quarterback. To draft a quarterback, to not draft a quarterback. So I would ask you Seahawks fans, and you can lay it out here in the comment section on YouTube, do you want the Seahawks to draft one? If they're sitting at 16 and Michael Penix is there, let's say Bo Nix is there, because we know the other guys aren't going to be there. Do you want them to select a guy there? Or are there too many other holes on this football team right now to not select a quarterback? They've got offensive line issues. They have, because here's the other thing too, and Rob brought this up. When you talk about drafting those two linemen, Oregon State and then, of course, uh, Fatano from uh, Washington, is we don't know right now the exact health situation of Abe Lucas. Fingers crossed that he's okay, but there could be some an issues with Abe Lucas, they signed George Fant in the offseason as maybe a, just a backup precautionary for Abe Lucas and his health. Now, if he's healthy, he's playing right tackle. You draft a lineman, you can slide those guys inside. But they need to get better on the offensive line. They need to get better on the defensive line. So I think at 16, if they stay there, they're probably going to go that route and not quarterback. I think we all understand that eventually they have got to find a quarterback of the future. Is it in this year's class? Do they have enough draft capital if they want to move up? Likely they don't unless they want to pass on some future draft picks, but we don't know where those draft picks are coming from or where they're going to be and how uh, appealing would that be to other teams. So if you don't get your first picks because you're not getting Williams, you're not getting Jaden Daniels, you're likely not getting Drake May. Is there a possibility to try and move? How, how far do you have to move up to get McCarthy if that's who you desire? Maybe they don't even like J.J. McCarthy. I think they talked to him at the Combine, but they may not even like the guy. So of the remaining characters left, if it's Knicks, Penix, Tulane quarterback, uh, what have you, Florida State, Travis, I don't know. I mean, his name hasn't really been mentioned all that much. Spencer Rattler, Oklahoma State. Do you just punt on drafting a quarterback this season and just go with what you have? I do believe they'll draft somebody, but I think it will be later, and I don't think it will be like a, a headliner name because I think he wants to, he being John Schneider, wants to draft a guy because he hasn't done it. Not that I don't know if he has not been allowed to do it because Pete Carroll was kind of running things for many, many years, but you know he's talked openly about coming from that Green Bay system where you kind of always drafted a quarterback. And one change they might do this year is keep three on the roster so they can just kind of develop a guy. And it might be nice to draft a guy later, just to take a flyer and develop him. Remember they did that in Green Bay. Matt Hasselbeck came from that. They traded for Matt Hasselbeck later. He's a late-round draft pick. 
They develop him in that system. He becomes a very, very good quarterback in the NFL. Certainly a guy you can win with and certainly a guy you can go to the Super Bowl with if all the other pieces are around him. So I do think they'll draft the guy. I don't think it will be high. I think it will be later. And they'll go into the season with Geno, Sam Howell, and this third quarterback. And I think the plan is to develop this third quarterback and hopefully in a couple of years, he's good enough to take over the team. Maybe Geno has a great year this season. You bring him back for one more. Maybe he doesn't. And Sam Howell comes in as your starter for one or two years. And then you hand the reins over to this other guy. But they have got to shore up the trenches right now. Because when you watch them play, that's where they get their asses kicked. It's just inside. They get their asses kicked on the offensive line, and they don't pressure anybody on the defensive line. They passed on that a year ago. We all love Devin, Devin Witherspoon, but they haven't addressed it, and they need to address it, and it needs to get better. And you look at next year's quarterback class, it's not great. Bob Condota, the Times, pointed it out, and he's right. I mean, you got Shadur Sanders, Quinn Ewers, and Cam Ward. That's not a good group. It just isn't. I mean, based on what you've seen, Sanders cl clearly kind of stands out as the best, but the other two, yeah, no. Uh, Kraken uh, lost their last home game uh, yesterday. Just a disappointing season. We talked about it, I think, last week. Well, this could be a hell of an offseason for the Kraken. they got four games remaining in the regular season. They've got to right the ship here in, in this offseason, or people are going to start losing interest. I, I can't tell you how many friends that I know that have season tickets that are not re-upping this year. I mean, every person, this is like, at least eight people, every person that I know that signed that initial three-year contract is not coming back. They're going to lose a lot of season ticket holders this year, a ton. And if they don't have a better offseason, a better year next season, you're going to see the interest starting to wane on the Kraken. And, and then at the same time, you've got the NBA heating up and the Sonics coming back, and then the Kraken are just going to be placed on the back burner for a long time. So, and then they know that as an organization, they know they need to get it right, but this is going to be clearly in their short existence, most important off season the Kraken have ever had. All right, coming up uh, later on the uh, Friday program here at pucksports.com, which of course you can watch and listen to everything at pucksports.com. Every, all the videos, all the audio is all at pucksports.com. Your one-stop shop right there, but it's also on, I know other people, uh, you know, take in all their media in different little areas. So it's on YouTube. Just search Puck Sports. It, we're on Apple, Spotify, Amazon. Just search Puck Sports right there, right to your phone. Uploaded every day, the Daily Puck Drop at 10 o'clock, 10 in the morning, Monday through Friday. And then all of our interviews get downloaded or are up for you to listen and watch on all the platforms at 1 o'clock. Friday's show includes a visit one more time with Ryan Divish of the Seattle Times, brought to you by Chalet Bowl, chaletbowl.com, Washington's oldest bowling alley, been serving fine folks since 1941. Shout out to Reggie and his family uh, for sponsoring the Ryan Divish segment. And then Chris Egan stops on by, spread his uh, sun, shine, and joy. Uh, we talk to Chris every Friday, and it's brought to you by Fat Zach's Pizza. Go check out fatzachspizza.com. They got a food truck. They do catering, businesses, parties, graduation parties, all of it. They're at Fat Zach's Pizza. All right, we're going to sign off. But I have a special surprise for you listeners and viewers. A special, special surprise to everyone. I want you to enjoy this. It's back. There will be more of this coming up soon here on the Daily Puck Drop. We'll try to do it every Friday. But your familiar funny voices are coming back stay tuned we'll talk to you soon as always we promise to be better ah uh, michael sean do got him just checking in with my man puck uh it's been a while you know talk, talking about the seahawks draft picks and uh you know the simplification of the prognostication emancipation of the draft uh, you gotta go michael Penix. uh you know he's quite quick running the 4 3 40 which we always knew with big p as i call him uh you know his elusiveness conclusiveness and utter decisiveness is it's just a great fit out here in the northwest don't mind the condensation. You know, I got I got to give a shout out to my homie Chris on the Man to Man podcast. Ah, uh, you know the thing about Chris. Speaking of condensation, he's so damn quick on that flag football field. I'm like, put us in the Olympics. We're bringing home the gold. Anyway, y'all go Cougs.
Softy Mahler here, baby, checking in with Mr. Puckett. I don't know where the hell you been, man. I've, I've been down here on frickin' Mott Lake walking the dogs up and down the street trying to figure out where Puck went. Then I got hungry. I had to stop into campus and get myself a fish sandwich. Put a little sprinkles on it, if you know what I mean, baby. Then I adopted two new dogs while I'm at it. Named them Pat and Chun. They're now part of the Mahler household, baby, if you know what I mean. I don't know, man. The only place I go to sports now is PuckSports.com, baby. Wherever you get your podcast, I, I, I encourage you to line in. Anyway, you can listen in at anywhere. Downtown Seattle, on the Palouse, frickin' Mott Lake. It doesn't matter. PuckSports.com, baby. Go dogs, baby. No shoes, no dice. <laughs> Would anybody like to smoke some pot? Yeah. I was born to love you. I was born to lick your face. I was born to rub you. But you were born to rub me first. What do you need my address for? We'd like to send out a mailer. <laughs> Mother of mercy, I don't speak Japanese! <laughs>